and welcome to Amelia United Methodist Church this morning. I feel awkward like I'm just talking to the side. I may turn and <laughs> at a diagonal. Announcements today. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to take it upon myself to thank everyone who helped out with Bible school last week. Um, if you were here during the week or if you worked behind the scenes, um, thank you so much. It was so much fun and the kids had a blast. Um, the other announcement is that if you are in Rebecca Circle tomorrow night, there is a picnic meeting out under the shelter at 7 o'clock. Six o'clock, excuse me. Rebecca Circle meeting out under the shelter at six o'clock tomorrow night. You would have. In Psalm 103, it is written, it, it's coming, you'll get your turn, I promise. <laughs> As a father shows compassion to his children, so does God show compassion to all those who revere him. I want to personally say a happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers and are father figures. Um, and we have a poem that is going to be read. <laughs> Yay! This poem is titled, What Makes a Dad? God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea. The generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, and the power of the eagle's flight. The joy of a, mount of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family in need. Then God combined these qualities. When there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. Thank you, and again, thank you to all of you fathers out there for being such a great example to my personal children and to the other children of this church. Pastor Ed. I just wanted to mention the uh, Bible study. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday this week, and we'll be discussing uh, book one and two in uh, Mere Christianity um, uh, by C.S. Lewis. So if you've got that book and been reading it, uh, if, if, you, if not, try to get a copy, and uh, we'll be discussing it Tuesday morning and then a, a different group on Thursday night. So it'll be the same discussions, but um, come and uh, be a part of that. And uh, we appreciate that. We're just going to read, it's the first 69 pages, I think, of the book. So, uh, and then we will meet in a few weeks and discuss the rest of the book. Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you for that. Yes, if you don't have a copy of the book, you can get on YouTube and it's, be, it's read. You can sit and listen to it read to you on YouTube of uh, Mere Christianity. It'd be book one and two of it. It's divided, it's got chapters, but it's divided into like four books. And uh, it's like 69, first 69 pages is one and two. So if you don't have a copy, go onto YouTube and you can get, pull it down and uh, hear, listen to it read to you so that you can pick it up. It's a good book. I think you'll, you'll find it interesting. So it's actually the harder of the three books, though, that we're going to read. So if you can get through this one, the other two will be much easier uh, for you. So thank you. And Mr. Mark Holman, our ad um, main council chair, has an announcement. You can't stay down there. You have to come up here so the people at home can hear you. Good morning, everybody. We're going to have a meeting June 30th. It's a very important meeting. It's going to discuss and give information about the Methodist denomination in the, in the trials that we're going through as a church here at Amelia United Methodist Church in the affiliation with the Methodist denomination. 
June 30th, we're going we're gonna to have a video to give you some more information about what it's about. We're going to have uh, time for questions and answers. Um, but this is, a, this is something that our church, and we all make up the church, not just some of us, all of us. And each of us have a vote on what we do. And it's very, very important that you be a part of these meetings. This will be the first meeting that we have, June 30th to Thursday night. We're going to do it at 7 o'clock in the evening. It'll probably go for about an hour and a half. Um, there'll be a couple other meetings after that, maybe a month or so later. But this will be the first one. And I encourage each and every one of you to come and participate because we need you. We need, to, we need to hear your ideas, your understanding, so that we can move forward with this. Thank you all. Thank you. Does anyone have any other announcements? Okay, then let us continue with, a, with prayer and welcome our Holy Spirit into our service this morning. In our Heavenly Father's name, amen. Please join me as I read from Psalm 119, verses 133 through 136. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant, and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join us as our praise band leads us in song.
When I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and save. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my right. We'll pray standing this morning. That'll be fine. Uh, we have one prayer request that we continue to pray for Steve Workman. His kidney cancer has spread to his liver and lungs. So we need to really remember him. Prayer, he's a friend of the Malks. And so we're, uh, we want to pray for him. Uh, are there unspoken requests you want to indicate with a lifted hand? A number of those this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do need you. Every hour we need you, Lord. We can do nothing without you, Lord. Father, you're our God, and we just give you praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we're thankful that in our daily walk of life, we can walk with you. You have made it possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior so that we could come to you. And so, Father, in this morning hour, draw us to yourself, we pray. May the Spirit draw each of us. May we feel your presence among us. And, Lord, may we, may we just give ourselves to you, for that's true worship, to give ourselves to you and to be received by you. Father, we bring our requests to you. We bring uh, this one who needs a healing touch. Ask that you'd reach out your hand and bring healing to him, Father. Nothing's impossible for you. And you are the great physician. So, Lord, touch him, we pray. We lift all of our cares and burdens to you, every unspoken request, Lord. You know every need. You know each one of us by name. And so, Father, we just uh, give ourselves to you. Have your way in our midst, we pray. Lord, as we continue to worship, may Jesus be lifted up and may he be glorified. We ask in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Children are dismissed to go to junior church. You can see they had a great time at Bible school. And uh, they averaged about 40 this year in Bible school. They had 40 kids. And uh, I think the offering was, what was the total? It was something like $859 and something that will go to the children's feeding program that the kids brought in. So it was a really... Uh, a, uh, a good, uh, good time and a good offering. And uh, it makes a big difference, Bible school. We had a lot of kids here. Of course, obviously, we had a lot of kids that don't go to our church. A number of them don't go to church anywhere. And so uh, it was a good time to talk with them. And you make a lot of difference. Uh, how many of you help with Bible school? Stand, everybody help with Bible school real quick. It's all over. We had leaders and squad leaders and... And all. Let's give them a, a hand of thanks uh, for all their work. And there were a lot more. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it and uh, all your work. And uh, actually, I was going to say one of our older members, but actually she's not that much older than me. <laughs> so I won't say it that way. But uh, one of them had an interesting experience, and I'm going to do something a little different. This mic's on, isn't it, guys? 
Uh, I'm going to ask Sally to come up. Come on, Sally. Sally's got a story to share uh, with you from Bible school that was important to her, and I think you'll find it important too. Good morning. Didn't expect this. <laughs> um, it really affected me in Bible school this year. Um, Terry and I were group leaders. And as we looked around, we were one of the oldest people here. And I began questioning, would the children more enjoy a, a younger leader? Or um, is this the place that we, sh we should be for this week? And the groups were divided into about, what, six children, something like that. And um, you would interact with the other groups, but you usually were with your group. And one of the nights out in um, recreation, it turned out we had to uh, borrow a child from the other group for a relay race. And our group was called the Pigs, and we got so silly, and we were Peppas and jumping and with a typical re relay race. But I got a chance to really interact with another child from this other group. And it couldn't have been more than five to seven minutes that we acted silly together and just, again, interacted with a child that I didn't necessarily, I did not know her. But um, Friday night, um, our closing night, we focused on kindness. I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional. This has really affected me. Again, I did not know the young lady. And I guess the crux of the story was that I was so questioning whether we needed to be here. And the children were asked to draw a picture. And she drew it, she said, to Sally and from the child's name, and she drew a heart. And to the side of the heart, she wrote a note to me. And she said, you were so kind to me. I love you. And then the part that really, I guess the word has got to me, was she drew a little arrow. And she said, you deserve this. And the interaction was so, it, it just was one of those times I didn't, I didn't think of it as being as, um, meaningful is obviously she did. This really, to me, it was just playing with the kids. And it got me to thinking um, the role of grandparents um, within a child's life. And I got to thinking about this young lady. I don't know her. Maybe she lives with the grandparents even. But um, she obviously needed that interaction with me. And God allowed me to be here and to interact with her. And it was just, um, it really struck me how we all really need to be kind to each other and, and just things that you don't think are that important, they are important to someone else. So, thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you and Terry for volunteering and being a part of it. I, it's for all ages. There's little things we just don't even realize that uh, make a difference in somebody's life. And uh, we appreciate that. I, she had shared that with me, and I thought, well, oh, you guys need to hear that too. Uh, it's not in vain what we do. Uh, it, the cup of cold water given in Christ's name has its reward. Sometimes we don't get it in this life, but we will get it eventually in the life that's yet to come. So we're thankful for that. Let's uh, go to the Lord this morning and let's look at uh, the scriptures. I want to look at Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, we're going to spend the next few weeks or so in the uh, first eight chapters of the book of Romans, laying some groundwork. And actually, uh, next week I think I'll shift to Acts simply because somebody asked me a question after the first service, and I want to answer it next week. So um, you might have the same question. They wanted to know something about Paul. Romans chapter 1, and I'm beginning to read with verse 1. 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him and for his name's sake we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And then looking down at verse 14. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. And that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your word is powerful and true. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through it, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom and you'd give us understanding. That your Holy Spirit would be upon us and teach us, lead us to the truth. So that we might actually know the truth. And the truth can set us free. So Lord, we pray that your Spirit would be upon us, direct our thinking. And direct everything that's said. And everything that's thought, we pray it in your name. Amen. We're going to look at Romans. Romans is the, really the theology book of the New Testament. We talk sometimes about um, the fact that Jesus, when he chose his apostles and his disciples, he called the common people. Many of the early apostles, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, they were all fishermen that he called right off the fishing boats. John seems to have been educated, but the others probably not. At least not very far in their education. He called tax collectors, zealots. There are numbers of different kinds. Those apostles were really a mixed group of people that he called, and he used them to turn the world upside down. He reminds us that he calls the common and empowers the common, which is good news. That means he can use us. But on the other hand, he also called Paul. Paul's the opposite end. Paul was brilliant. He was a student of the top teacher in the entire nation. And he was the top student, which puts Paul heads above everyone else. At this point in his life, if he was studying under Gamaliel, which was his teacher, we're told, if he's going to study under Gamaliel at this point in his life, he's probably memorized two thirds of the Old Testament. Now think about that. And he could have quoted it word for word to you. Because that's what it required. That's what was required of them. And he was the top. This man is an intellectual to the point that he could speak and go to Athens and go up onto Mars Hill there in Athens, there in the book of Acts, and stand where Plato and Aristotle and Socrates had stood. And with the philosophers and their top intellectuals of the world, he was able to argue the Christian faith. And it says there, he quoted them, their own philosophers and their own poets. He knew all of that. He had studied it. He had read it. And he held them spellbound. 
where they had difficulties when he began to talk about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's when they started to have some difficulty, but up to then he his wisdom was profound. And towards the end of his life, when he stood before King Agrippa, and he began to talk about the resurrection of the dead, you'll remember that the king, this is recorded in Acts also, said, Paul, he says, your great learning has made you mad. Recognizing the great learning of Paul. Paul was an intellectual of intellectuals. A scholar of scholars. He's the author of this book. On top of that, he was a Pharisee, which means he was at the top morally. He was a student of the Word. He knew the Word inside and out. He had been a Pharisee, which means he was very rigid in his life and his morality. He was the cream of the crop. And the question that was asked to me uh, by someone was, well, how did Paul get from being that to becoming a Christian and becoming the greatest missionary of the Christian movement? Because most of the letters of Paul and most of two-thirds of Acts all center around this man's journey across the world proclaiming the gospel. Now, that was a good question. Are you interested in knowing the answer? You'll have to come back next week. Because <laughs> next week, <laughs> I'll show you the answer. It's in the scriptures. Yeah, Paul, the intellectual of the intellectuals. This man is brilliant. This man writes and sits down and writes this book to Rome. And in it, the theology of Christianity and everything Christ taught and all is laid out and presented in a very orderly way. He's much like uh, the C.S. Lewis of his time. Some of you are reading the book and as we're doing. Uh, and Lewis is that kind of an intellectual. C.S. Lewis uh, was brilliant. They say that his mind was so sharp and his memory was so good that he had a substantial library there in his, in his rooms there at um, Cambridge in England where he taught. And they say that you could go and pull any book off the shelf that you wanted to in his library, which was a big library. It turned any page you wanted and start reading and he could quote you the rest of the page. That's how sharp he was. Uh, he had a photographic memory. And so if you're reading uh, Mere Christianity, he lays out, he was an agnostic who became a believer, a Christian, uh, through the Spirit and under uh, his friend uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings and the Ring Trilogy, The Hobbits and stuff. I was the one that helped to lead him to the Lord. He had become a Christian, and then Lewis became a Christian. Paul's like that. And this is a wonderful book. It begins right off where you should begin. Talking about Jesus. He starts right off with Christ. He starts right off with this gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. That centers totally around Jesus. He says it's a gospel that the prophets prophesied about. He's a Jewish scholar. He's memorized the prophets. He said, this is the one that they, they talked about. This is the one that they, they told us all about what he would be like when he came. And you may remember Matthew in the writing of his gospel. Matthew was a Jew. Luke doesn't include him much. We've been looking at Luke, but Luke was not a Jew. Luke was a Greek. Matthew was a Jew. And all through the gospel of Matthew, Matthew continually says, this was done as was foretold by the prophet. And he'll name the prophet and quote the verse. The prophets told all about it. Matthew's wanting them to realize this is all in fulfillment of the prophets. And that's where Paul starts. He said, the prophets told us all about it. 
And now here he has come, all about this Jesus. And he said, hey, this Jesus, he, he's the God-man. And his human, when it relates to his human form, he's a son of David. He follows the throne, the, the offspring of David, and he will sit on the throne of David, which is what the prophet said. When Messiah come, he comes, he will do. As far as his human nature, he's a descendant of David. And Luke very carefully gives us that genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam, but gets to David and then starts to show it coming forth. So that in, and you need to realize Luke's genealogy is the genealogy of Mary, not Joseph. That's why it's different than Matthew's genealogy. Both are descendants of David. But the reality is that Paul is fully aware of and Luke is fully aware of is that Jesus was born of a virgin. His mother Mary was a virgin. And that the child that was conceived in her was conceived by the Holy Ghost, not by a man. And he bears the seed of God. So that Paul can write here in the first of Romans, in his human descendancy in nature, he's a descendant of David. But in his spirit and spiritual he is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. He's shown that he's more than the descendant of David. He's also the Son of God. Paul sends it out there loud and clear. He's declared to be the Son of God. There's something about him. Yes, he was born of Mary, but he's also born of the Holy Spirit. He's after the tribe of David, but he's also the Son of God. And it was shown by the resurrection of the dead. Oh, he gave us some other clues too, didn't he? I mean, how could you miss it when you read about his life and you follow his life? Cast out demons. Every time you see him heal a blind man. Every time you see him raise the dead. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He healed the sick every time they brought him to him. He walked on water. He spoke the word and the storms and the winds and the waves obeyed him. Demons obeyed him. He can take Loaves and fish and feed 5,000 with it. Oh, there are lots of signs that this is more than just a, a simple human being after the order of David. Paul says, as to his spirit, he is declared to be the Son of God. Peter, James, and John got a glimpse there in the Gospels when they saw him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they saw him as he was. Paul says, this is the one the prophets talked about. This is the one that has come to us. And through him, we have received grace. And we have received apostleship. We have been sent. And we've been sent to the Gentiles as well as the Jews to proclaim this gospel so that the Gentiles can repent and obey and believe. And they too can be part. Aren't you glad that they took it to the Gentile world? Because you and I would be Gentiles. In their world, they were only to the Jewish world. You're either a Jew, and if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Just like in the Roman world, you're either part of the civilized Roman world, or you're a barbarian. It didn't matter where else you came from, you'd be considered a barbarian. Someone on the outside. Then I love what Paul says, we're obligated, therefore, 
I'm obligated to take this message, this gospel, and I'm obligated to take it to the Gentiles and to the Jews, to the rich, to the poor. Doesn't matter who they are. I'm obligated to take this gospel to them and to tell them about it. And that's why I want to come to you in Rome. And I want to come and be among you so that I might bear fruit among you. And then this powerful verse down there in verse 16. If you want to memorize a verse, this would really be a good one for our day for us to memorize. Because Paul says this. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God. For the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. I am not ashamed of the gospel. There's nothing in it that I need to be ashamed about. It is the power of God for salvation to the whole world. If people come to Christ, they can be saved. If they don't come to Christ, they will be lost for all of eternity. This is the power of God. This is what God has designed. This is what God has sent into the world. That whosoever believes in Christ and lives in Him, they will have eternal life. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of, of that gospel. Paul has stood on Mars Hill with those philosophers and they mocked him when he started talking about the resurrection of the dead. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the resurrection from the dead that showed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's the power of the gospel. Let me say this to you this morning. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. Let me say it again. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. We live in a culture that mocks it. We live in a culture that wants to go its own way. And if you're old-fashioned in our day, if you speak up against anything or proclaim anything, you're considered judgmental or you're considered, they'll mock you, they'll say, that's old stuff. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. It'll hold up intellectually. It'll hold up mentally. It's one of the reasons we're reading Mere Christianity. I have another book beside my bed. Actually, it's right next to my bed because I read some in it sometimes at night when I wake up. It's called Mere Christians. It's a book that's a collection of writings. Each writing's about three to five pages long, which makes it nice by your bed that you can read one of the stories. And they're all written by leading thinkers and writers and people of our day. Some are politicians. And they're all writing how C.S. Lewis made a difference in his writings, in their faith, and in their, their lives as Christians. And the one thing that... Uh, people like Anne Rice, who wrote all the vampire stories and stuff. Anne Rice, reading, reading uh, Lewis, became a Christian. And she quit writing all those vampire stories. She said she'd never write one again. She became a believer. But the one thing that keeps coming back over and over is the thing that they loved about Lewis was this. In reading Lewis and thinking with Lewis, they realized they did not have to check their brains at the door to be a Christian. He showed us that we can think and it'll hold up. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the way of salvation, and there is no other. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It is the way of salvation. It's fascinating to me how reading sometimes like that, reading somebody even like Lewis can make such a difference. And I mean, there's probably 40 or 50 people, all like Anne Rice in there, writing how it made a difference and changed their life. Or I think of when uh, Schaeffer, some of Francis Schaeffer's books and how 
Eric Clapton, you may remember some years back, Eric Clapton uh, lost a son. His wife and his son were in a hotel somewhere over here, and he was off singing, doing a concert somewhere. And somehow their boy, I think he was five, somebody said, got up onto the balcony. They were on about the fifth or sixth floor of the hotel and fell off the balcony and was killed. Clapton, of course, went into pretty deep depression. Somebody gave him a copy of one of Schaefer's books and he became a Christian, turned his life around, wrote that song, If I See You, Will I See You in Heaven? If I See You, Will You Know Me There? If I See You in Heaven, a great song. Of and What's fascinating is he gave the book to Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper became a Christian. Alice Cooper changed his life around. He gave it to Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi became a believer by reading it. And I was with Martin Smith, who was the lead singer for Delirious. We were at uh, Ichthus down in uh, Kentucky. And Martin was telling me that Delirious, which is a Christian rock group that was really, really good, that Bon Jovi had called, and this was in May, they were going to be leaving that next fall and touring with Bon Jovi. They were going to be the opening for all of Bon Jovi's concerts in Europe as he went across England and to the others. And that Bon Jovi had told him, I want you to sing all of your Christian songs. And he said, you're to give an altar call at every one of my concerts. The Lord can take and turn people around. Paul says, we don't have anything to be ashamed of in the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. And within it, there is a, a power that comes by faith. A righteousness that we receive by faith, by trusting and believing in Jesus Christ. We've talked about what it means to believe. To believe means I stand in it. It doesn't just say I believe it's there. I stand in it. I live in it. And it's a way of salvation. And Paul says we don't have to be ashamed. It is the power of God to change us and make us new. And to give us new life. And it's a salvation that comes by faith. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we deserve. It's the grace of God, Paul says. We can't just clean our lives up and try to live better lives because none of us are very good at it. We do it a little bit. We try to change ourselves, and we need to realize that we can't change ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to change us, the power of God to change us, and to make us new. You and I try, and we do pretty good for a little while, and then it kind of goes by the by. And how do we make up for all the times that we fail? The grace of God. Paul says this, this is a powerful gospel. Jesus Christ. It centers in Christ and His death and His resurrection. And it's a salvation that comes by faith as we believe and trust in Him. And His Holy Spirit changes us and He takes His righteousness and puts it in us. And we become the people of God. We live in a really crazy culture, don't we? It's getting crazier by the day, it seems like to me. It's an insane culture. Uh, I just heard uh, yesterday someone was sharing with me, you know, they've, we've had all this stuff that goes on and with um, men and women's bodies and women and men's bodies. And now I guess it's gone to the place that some are identifying that they're not really people, they're animals. And that in the public schools in Columbus and Pickerington, and somebody said that here it was there was a petition for it here, even here at our system. Kids are identifying as cats or other things rather than as children. And so it's required in all their schools they have to have litter kitty litter litter boxes in every classroom. I'm I'm not I'm not joking. This was a teacher. 
It's in every class. She said they have to have a litter box. It was petitioned here. I don't think it got through to put them in the classes. And one of their teachers was fired because when the kid meowed to him, he didn't meow back and they fired him. The world's gotten crazy. It's a crazy world. The gospel is still the gospel. And we don't have to be ashamed of it. And we don't have to back down. We can proclaim it proudly. It is the power of God that can transform the world. And I'll tell you, it's the only hope that we have in our world. For God and his power to transform. It's just going to get worse. And I think you'll see it as we go through Romans. In fact, further in this chapter in Romans, he talks about those things and kind of tells us why they're happening. And I think you'll see it. We'll get to it in a couple weeks. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. Paul and all of his intellect, he's at the top of the intellectual world. He can rub elbows with the very top. And he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It'll hold up. It'll stand strong because there's power in it. It's the power of God himself. And there's salvation in it. Salvation through Jesus Christ. And he alone is the way of salvation. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not a way. He is the way. And there is no other we don't have to be ashamed of it. There's power in it. It'll change us. And it can make us new. We just believe. And Paul says, that's why I proclaim it. I proclaim it to the wise and the foolish, the rich, the poor, the Jew, the Gentile, so that whosoever will believe can be saved. Father in heaven, we're thankful. We're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for what he does in our lives. We're thankful, Lord, that you have brought salvation into the world through Jesus Christ. You did it by becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And so, Father, we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Lord, don't let us be ashamed. Don't let us back down. Don't let us be afraid. Because there's power in the gospel. Because it's your power at work for the salvation of the world. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for dying to save us. We pray it in your name. Amen. Stand and join our closing hymn. Jesus Christ will win the battle. He is our fortress and our shield. And Lord, we're not ashamed to be called his disciples, to be called his people. Go with us from this place. 
May Jesus walk in us, we pray. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.